Welcome to the fifth talk in the Idaflik lecture series. With this series, we want to create an alternative while we can't fly, unfortunately. And as always, you watching at home can ask your questions in the comments at any time, and we'll answer them at the end. First, a quick introduction to Idaflik. The Idaflik is the head organization of the Aka Fleeks or the Aka, uh, Academic Flight Clubs of Germany. There are 10 in Germany and in those um, students, university students, research, build and fly their own sailplanes and motor gliders. Historically, a lot of advancements in the gliding space have been made in these academic flight clubs. For example, first glass fiber and carbon fiber planes and a lot of aerodynamic improvements. My name is Dominic Pöppe. I, of course, am a member of Idaflik and also of Akaflik Karlsruhe and the project leader of the plane AKX, which you can see on this poster behind me. Tonight's guest is Paolo Iskold. He is professor at Cal Poly and also an engineer behind many successful prototype planes. With the Nixus project, he's continuing the non plus ultra philosophy from other planes like the SB10, ETA, or Concordia, just to name a few. For Paolo, this project is the first time he's building a non powered plane, and with it, he's pushing for the max. Um, he's really pushing the envelope with what you can do with a glider and also integrating a lot of groundbreaking tech. Now, Paolo, tell us a little bit about yourself. What is your background and how did you gain your experience needed for such a project? Hey, Dominique. First of all, it's a pleasure to be here, talk with the Ida Flick. Um, I started my career exactly 20 years ago, 21 years ago, and, and I started building airplanes um, at my university in Brazil. And I went, when I first designed my first airplane, my advisor at that time um, gave me a gift. And the gift was to, to go to Germany to, to work on the Ackerflick Brauschwein for two months, building the SB-14. And, and that's how I got involved with all those airplanes. So being here to talk with the Ida Flick brings me good memories for that time that I was on the Ackerflick. Uh, design and build those airplanes. So it's a big pleasure to, to be talking here. But yeah, as you mentioned, I start building the airplanes that you can see on the screen. Most of them racers and aerobatic airplanes. I got involved on the Red Bull Air Race for, for more than 10 years. And, and then after all that, got an got a invitation to, to build a glider. And, and that's how Nixus started. Nice. So um, as we can see on the slide now, over the years, you've designed uh, and built so many great planes. Um, but of course, I want to know, do you get to fly them yourself as, as well? And for you personally, what came first? Was it the engineering or was it the, fly, the flying aspect? No, I, I actually, I only flew airplanes that I built a couple month ago, a month ago, I believe, and that was Nixus, all those airplanes that you see on the screen. I barely can fit inside them because I'm a, <laughs> a big person and, and I never give up on drag, you know, to re minimize drag. I was always trying to reduce the space. And actually the last design that I did in Brazil where, where I start my career was the airplane on the top right, Anakin. And that one, I can't even sit on the cockpit. I, I, can't, I can't fit to go into the airplane. So engineer for me is the, is the, is the main drive for, for all my activities. Um, and come with the engineer, the building and the, the, uh, the fine tuning of the airplanes and put the airplanes to fly and really uh, chase the, the maximum performance, you know, because as soon as you, you start flying, the performance is not there. But uh, that process to, to fine tune the airplane is, is really drives my attention. I, I like to fly. I'm a, I was a pilot in Brazil when I moved to the US. Uh, I didn't have my license. I'm working on having my license again. 
Um, but I'm for sure I'm not the best pilot in the world. So I, I'm trying hard to to design the best stuff in the world and find the better best pilots available uh, to fly the stuff that I build. And so far I'm being successful in that. <laughs> Makes sense. So coming back to Nixus, um, with the Nixus project, what was your goal? What did you want to achieve? Um, so I guess to talk about that, I need to tell a little bit about the story of Nixus and and I have an image here of the, the airplane, but um, I got this invitation from, from a friend in Brazil that for years and years was trying to put me to design airplane, uh, sailplanes. And I was telling him, no, I, I, let's not do that. You know, all the, the manufacturers, they're so far ahead of us that there is nothing that we can really do better than them. Uh, but then one day he invited me to, to go fly with him on an ash study in Brazil. And his name is Sergio Andrade. He's the, the, the main leader on this project. And, and I flew with Sergio on the, the ash study. And that was actually my second time flying an open class airplane. I did a really short flight on the SB-10 during my time in, in Braunschweig. And then I flew the ash study. So the ash study was the first one that I actually was on controls. And it was really interesting for me that, um, you know, all the flap and, and operation and, and try to optimize the flap deflection. And I start to talk with Serge about that. And, and he's telling me that, you know, per the flight manual, that is um, the flap position should be a, uh, uh, optimized based on velocity. And then I told him, well, I mean, but uh, not really velocity is supposed to be um, lift coefficient or angle of attack. And so that the whole discussion about how to optimize flaps start. And, and I told Sergio, hey, this is, this is something that we can contribute for the, for the gliding um, and sailplane development. And, and that's really how the whole project started is, okay, what can we do different from, from the manufacturers that can drive in the future uh, new technologies or, or better gliders? And, and the idea to introduce a fly-by-wire system to then control all the flap and aileron deflections to try to optimize that to the maximum. So beside that, um, the challenge to build a high aspect ratio wing and, and the, the new composite techniques uh, was a, a really important driver for me. And, and those two things is really what uh, uh, defined the project. It's build a high aspect ratio wing with a high wing loading for, for gliders and use fly-by-wire system to control the, the, the deflection of the control surfaces of this wing. So yeah, that sounds quite ambitious to put all of that into one plane. And of course, something like that can't be done alone. Um, so tell us, who else is part of your team? Yeah, I, I only figured out that was ambitions uh, halfway through the process. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't figure out that earlier. Um, but um, when I was, you know, with the, the problem on my, my shoulders, trying to solve all that, I started to look for people to help me. And, and of course, as I mentioned, Sergio here on the, on the right side of the screen was the person driving this project. And, and sponsoring us, but not only sponsoring us, but giving us the, the fuel, the energy to, to do that. Sergio was always driven by, you know, technology. He likes new technology, sailboats, sailplanes. He's always looking for new stuff. Um, and every time that I come with one idea that I thought was, you know, this is brilliant. He was always pushing me to do something more and more and more. Um, so the first, per the first thing that Sergio told me is, okay, you're going to do the aerodynamic, uh, design of this wing, but I want you to have a person, uh, reviewing your, your work. So I start to talk with Mark Malmer and at the same time, Sergio starts to talk with Luke Borsman to do that job. It ended up that Sergio got to, to agreement with Luke and, 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 and Luke joined the team. 
to help us uh, with the aerodynamic design. At that time, I had my airfoils design based on stuff that I learned with uh, Mr. Armin Quast during my time in Brauschwein. Armin was the person who um, received me in, in Brauschwein. I stayed at his house during my time there. And, and then I sent that to Luke and Luke reveal, and he came back with his airfoil. Um, I didn't give up on my design. So I, I analyzing the airfoil that he designed, I did a second iteration of my design, sent back to him and say, hey, I, what about this one? And, and then he told me, well, your lower surface is better than my lower surface. My upper surface is better than your upper surface. Why we don't create an airfoil together? And, and that's what I we did. And for me, it's it's a it's an honor, you know, to to sign an airfoil with Luke today. Uh, Luke did a lot of uh, work with uh, plan form optimization, winglet optimization, uh, you know, turbulators design. So that was a gr great learning experience for me to work with him. Um, at a very early phase of the project. Um, I had a friend in Brazil, Otavio Kovacs. Um, we are actually building an airplane together in Brazil. And I told him, hey, this is going to be my next project, fly-by-wire airplane. We discussed this a little bit. And Otavio lived in, in, in San Jose dos Campos, the Embraer city. And going back to his city, he went to a restaurant and he met Dag Fing Gengses, which uh, is the a world uh, leader in flyby-wire technology. And he mentioned to Dagfin on a restaurant, hey, I have a friend in, in the city in Brazil and he's trying to build a sailplane with flyby-wire system. So Dagfin got some interest on that. I contact Dagfin, I pretty much ask him for help and say, hey, I need a, a, a advisor, you know, for the flyby-wire. So he joined the team and it's been a, a, a great help for us. Uh, on the flyby wire part. And then I, I when I moved to US, uh, Dagfin has a house close to the place that I was living at that time and building Nixus at that time. And Dagfin told me, come visit us. And that's Minden in Nevada. And, and he invited for the, for the lunch, uh, Jim Payne. And we talk a little bit about the glider project. Jim shows some interest. And I didn't say anything at that time, but on the back of my mind, I said, okay, I need to find an opportunity to invite him to be the test pilot. And after a couple of visits and he went to see the fabrication, I was brave enough to, 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 to make that offer to him. It's, I don't know if it's a, it's a decent offer, you know, invite someone to do the first flight of airplane that you're building. Uh, but he accept that and Jack and Jim Payne joined the team. Um, for the flight test and the flight operations. And, and we actually now, pre, I'm pretty much living in his house on the last two weeks, um, chasing good weather to, to, to do good flights with Nixon. So yes, I always, as the slide says, I always like to say that I'm standing on giant's shoulders, uh, copying a little bit what uh, Newton said, that um, Nixus is only possible because there is this team of person uh, beside me supporting all the, the the stuff that we did. And this is not to mention all the people that help on the fabrication, you know. Um, uh, Cato Props was the company that I was um, um, placed when I started to build and they did a lot of work with me, uh, help a lot. And many other friends, Eric Stewart, Nick, Nick Jenks, um, did a lot of work to, to put this airplane together. So it, it sounds, um, I, I mean, I myself couldn't imagine a better team to have to, to accomplish such a project. Um, just briefly for those who don't know, Nixus, it's a two-seater. It's, it's based on an ASH-30 fuselage. And um, as Paolo already mentioned, it's fitted with custom wings. So the question that pops into my head, why custom wings? Why not take a pair of decent wings and retrofit them with some fly-by wire. And also, why a two-seater? Why not a single-seater? <laughs> yeah, as I, as I mentioned before, um, today, looking back, that might be a, a better option for, <laughs> to develop the fly-by wire. 
uh, just grab a, a set of commercial wings and change the wings. Um, however, you know, the, the commercial wings, they have a bunch of control system inside the wing that we don't actually need. So that will require a lot of surgery on the, the, on the wings to remove all of that. Uh, but for sure, it will be less work. On the other hand, develop the wings was a, a, a huge learning experience for myself. Uh, to do the, the, the design of the new airfoils uh, with Borsman and, and learn how to avoid this picture is the old HQ-35 that my friend Armin Quast designed that had the lift plateau uh, on the airfoils. Uh, as the angle of attack increase, the lift coefficient increase up to a certain point where you have a kind of a, a, a preliminary stall. It's not really the stall, it's just a transition point moving forward pretty fast. And, and then you keep increase angle of attack and the airfoil eventually uh, produce more lift again. Um, so Nix's airfoils doesn't have that lift plateau, so it's, it's pretty flat. And that is a designing airfoil like that was only, or, or learn how to design airfoil like that was only possible because we designed the new wing. If we had used an old wing, I would never have the experience to design this. Um, and I can mention other stuff like, uh, we, we can talk more about that later, uh, the structure analysis of this new wing, you know, uh, doing a, a 53 aspect ratio wing, um, for sure from the engineer point of view is, is a huge challenge. Mm. Um, to accomplish that, we use a pre-preg materials and that's kind of unique for the sailplane industry as well. So I had to learn myself how to handle pre-preg materials and how to design with pre-preg materials. So all that learning experience for me was really important and, and, and Serge was willing to support that. Another aspect that needs to be considered is we are trying to develop this super ship a uh, glider that was super strong, especially in strong weather conditions. And none of the commercial wings available for an airplane of this size um, had the, the wing loading capability that we are looking for. And, and Concordia, at the time that we, we started the project, Concordia was pretty much doing his first flight. So there is a lot of expectation on that. And we try to followed a little bit of Dick Butler's um, idea with the Concordia, you know, to, to have this high wing loading, high wing aspect ratio wing. So that drove a lot the decision to, to build a new wing as well. And uh, what about the double seater? Why did you choose that? Oh, the double seater. Um, it, it is an interesting question. Um, Sergio, he has some difficulties to walk. So normally, uh, he can walk with some difficult and on the seating position to fly, he is perfectly able to fly the airplane and drive the rudder pedals. Um, but um, if he's doing long flights, um, um, he and, and there is the chance to land out of the field, um, he need a, someone to help him. So he, he always liked to have a, a, a two-seater airplane for that, that reason. He also jokes that, uh, you know, if you fly long distance, long flights alone, um, sometimes you get crazy inside the sailplane. It's better to have someone to talk a little bit and share all the good stuff and the bad stuff that you, you have on the cockpit. So he, he's always like to have a two-seater airplane. And, and that's a, a little opening on the fly-by-wire technology that is also interesting one of the topics that we're trying to investigate now a lot is the uh, reduction of adverse yaw with the fly-by-wire. Because when you apply ailerons, I can give you full aileron authority with minimum, induce, uh, with minimum adverse yaw. And then as you center the, the control system, I can give you back flaps, for instance. Um, so the mixing system that we have on the aileron flap can be completely customized to to allow a better handling of the airplane and 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 
therefore use require less use of rudder pedals or stuff like that. So it is interesting that uh, the flyby wire, the two seaters, all this has a connection on on, on make sailplanes more accessible for mm. for everybody. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so you've already mentioned similar planes, I guess, like the SP10 or a Concordia. Where would you say, or in what aspects is uh, Nixa similar to those, and in what aspects does it distinguish itself? Um, well, that's a that's a question that you know have many variables um, <laughs> that I can't answer. Um, I guess the the um, the high aspect ratio is something that's similar between them. Um, of course, Concordia is a single place and X is a two seater, so there is a drag penalty on that. Um, but the biggest difference from and Concordia and X is are both sailplanes, I believe, that are designed for the same type of um, um, performance. Mm -hmm. um, Concordia may be a little bit more focused on, on competition and Nikos is uh, more focused on, on record flights because it's okay. heavier and has the, the penalty of the two-seater fuselage. Um, but the biggest difference is Nikos is trying to explore this fly-by-wire automatic control system technology that neither of them uh, are doing. Yeah. But... Um, one thing in common with those projects, all of them are trying to do something new for for soaring, and and I think that 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 what will put Nixus on the same page in history with all those other important sailplanes is if we can succeed with this flyby wire technology, and and I'm not saying that Nixus will be the best airplane with flyby wire technology. If I would do another one now, it would be way better than Nixus because <laughs> we learned so much. But if we can transfer that to to new sailplanes, I think that that will put Nixus on the same page as as those other important sailplanes. Yeah, I think so too. Um, so of course, the uh, the design of an airfoil can make or break the whole plane. For you going into Nixus, what was your design process for for your airfoil? Um, the design process for the airfoil was pretty similar to what uh, uh, Luke Borsman's and, and Christoph Krabuski design of the Diana um, did as well. Um, we mainly we use X foil with the calibration process that Luke um, has, and and then still there is a lot of try and error on adjust the geometry and the pressure distribution to what we want. Um, some of the, the I don't have a, enough slides to, to go into details about that here, but um, one uh, important aspect is that we designed the airfoils today with the flaps down and trying to get the, the maximum uh, lift out of that configuration and, and have a good you know, uh, pressure gradient uh, towards the trailing edge. And then the flap up configuration is pretty much a consequence of whatever you can do with the flaps down configuration. Um, but uh, yeah, so that was the, the 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 process to design the airfoil. The main goal was, of course, uh, at the low CL range, minimize the drag, and especially with the flap up configuration, to try to to avoid the 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 laminar bucked buck area uh, to be on the high speed range of the sailplane. So we are talking about a sailplane that will be flying at higher speeds most of the time, uh, pretty close to VNE, and have have the VNE on this outside the drag bucket. Uh, would not be acceptable for us. So <laughs> lower the drag bucket as much as we could with the minimum drag was a, a high priority. Uh, but at the same time, at the high CL, um, eliminate or minimize the, the lift um, plateau, which I believe 
has been shown to be really effective to the handling and thermal characteristics of Nixus so far. Interesting. So uh, designing your airfoil is one thing, but um, I mean, you have you also have to ensure that you can build your ultra thin and ultra long wings with materials that you can find on planet Earth. So um, how did you go about the structural aspect of building such a plane? Yeah. Yeah, you're right. I, I forgot to mention that uh, one of the, the the ways to reduce your drag at high speed is reduce your thickness. And and actually, that was the first question that uh, Luke asked me is, is how thin can I go? <laughs> and I gave him the number 13 and a half uh, percent. And because I knew that the structural problem was coming. And... Nixus was really lucky because at the same time, uh, I got involved on the X-57 project with NASA. And NASA gave me the, the open paper to, to design the structural part of that wing. And, when they, and I was designing Nixus at the same time. And when they gave me that, I decided to use the same material system that I, I was planning to use for Nixus which was a pre-preg system for the spark caps uh, with a high strength fibers and a high modulus fiber wet layup for the skins. And so, and I say that that was lucky because I was able to, to develop Nixus and develop the X57 pretty much in parallel. An experience that I learned on the X57 project, I was able to use a Nixus and vice versa. And, and, you know, because the two projects are not exactly at the same time, uh, you always learn a little bit here and there that you can transfer to, to one project and the other. Onyxus, uh, a big... Um, so one of the, the, the things that I was able to cross was material property. So for the X57 project, we did a full uh, set of tests, material tests, uh, at room temperature, elevate temperature, dry, wet. And all of that set of information was really useful for Nixus because now for my structure analysis, I have I really have really good material data. Um, the second step for the structure analysis was the development of um, a vortex lattice method uh, for nonlinear aerodynamics so I could predict uh, even closer to the stall um, the lift distribution, but also with an uh, elastic wing. As you can see on the screen, um, all the loads are calculated for this elastic wing. And, and at the same time that I was calculating loads with this software, the software was out, automatically generating a really detailed fee model that I was able to, to do the stress analysis and the failure analysis of the composites. So I guess those two... Uh, tools together, plus the material data that I had available, what was made possible to design the aspect ratio wing that Nixus has, 53.3, with the, the non-lifting weight that Nixus has. Because, you know, if you look uh, a, a single place sailplane, um, the weight of the fuselage, it's, it's really light. And, and then you can achieve your maximum weight, uh, putting ballast on the wings, which reduce bending moment a lot. But Nixus had a really heavy fuselage, two-seater plus the motor. Uh, so we can go 950 kilograms without ballast almost. Oh. <laughs> and, and then you know, my bending moments are insane or high. <laughs> And so with all the fidelity of those tools, plus the knowledge of the materials, plus the, the, the type of fibers, uh, I, I do think I have a slide here to talk about that. Let's jump those slides a little bit. Yeah, so here you can see on this chart, it shows on the horizontal axis, the modules of the fibers, and the vertical axis, the, the strength. And those fibers that are plot here are hexel fibers, so typical hexel fibers. The, the red circle is a typical carbon fiber that you buy, you know, to build any type of stuff. It's the, the called the AS4 fibers. So for Nixus, for the spark caps, we use IM2C, 
with the high, high strength fiber. It's not the, the top that you can buy or let's say the top that is available because we can actually, it, it's impossible to buy this for uh, a private project like that. But for a private project, we're able to buy IM2C with a high strength, give us 40% more strength. And then and with 30% more uh, stiffness. And, and for the skin, because now as the wing increase aspect ratio and in the airfoil decrease uh, thickness, the cross section of your wing is pretty small. So the torsional stiffness starts to become really, really a big problem. So that's the reason that we decided to go high modulus with the HM63 which would give us 90%, almost double the stiffness of normal carbon fiber. So that, that was really what made Nix's wing possible um, from the structural point of view. Interesting. Um, so coming from a Ackerflieg perspective over here in Germany, we usually take many, many years to build a plane, but in fairness, we also only do it in our free time. But so from our point of view, um, the speed at which you built Nixus was really impressive. However, not everything went perfect for you, isn't that right? You had a setback when testing the wing. What went wrong? Uh, yeah, so I don't think the speed that I built was super fast. It still <laughs> took me almost two years to build it, design and build it. But yeah, it's faster than students build it. Uh, I agree because I had a contract with me, so I, I need to finish. <laughs> otherwise, uh, I would be in troubles with the contract. Uh, but and 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 I was able to hire people to help me when I need help. So that that was a huge advantage for the time. But um, you're right. So we did all the. I have some pictures here for the fabrication of the wing. Um, so just. I guess you're right. I, I, I did move quite fast because on those two years, I had to build an outer clave. You can see the, the picture of the outer clave that I built here to, to cook the spark caps. I need to build all the modes that you can see on the top pictures and produce all the parts. And that was a lot of work. Uh, here I have other pictures of the fabrication. Um, this picture on the bottom right is interesting. Is the the spark cap for the... Um, outboard left wing, top cap, so compression cap, and it's 67 layers of carbon fiber. Um, the inboard wings uh, at the compression cap, if I remember right, was about 183 layers. Wow. So as you can imagine, and this is 183 layers is about an inch and a quarter, so 32 millimeters thick. And they're about seven inches, which is what, 200 millimeters wide. So do this um, wet layup is virtually impossible. And, and here are more pictures of the wing, first time being jigged to the fuselage. Um, Nixus has also a big challenge, you know, is a, is a 28 meter wing, uh, 92 feet. And it's kind of hard to have a hanger with that type of space. So I, I see myself working outside a lot of times under the sun. And you know, California during the summer, it's pretty hot. It's hotter than Brazil. Um, and so we had to do that. And, and then it comes to the day of the structural test. And I guess the top picture is not a picture that I share quite often, but made a good exception for you guys is <laughs> uh, the it's the end of the first structural test you can see myself on the ladder uh, looking to what just happened you can see the outboard wing on the floor the inboard wing is still on my stand the wing was at 45 degrees and I was pulling the wings down using some drums with uh, water on the ground to simulate a weight and pulling the wing down with chain hoists. And then the wing actually took the load and we all celebrate celebrating that. I had Sergio on the phone with me and I told him, hey, Sergio, we did it. it, it passed the test. 
And then all of a sudden, boom, and, and the wing snapped right at the junction. And that was devastating for me. As an engineer, I was like, I, I, I didn't know where to put my head. You know, I, my feeling was I need to dig a hole in the ground and stuck my head inside. I was ashamed of that. Um, Jim Payne was there with me, and Jackie was there. Craig Cater was there. Nick Jenkins, that helped a lot on fabrication, was there. And all, all of them was pretty supportive. And, and But even that was hard, really hard. And then I told Sergio that I just broke the wing, and, and he told me that he was actually flying. And he told me, well, I'll figure it out. I will call you later. <laughs> and 30 minutes later, he gave me a call, and, and I explained to him what I just did. I was almost crying, to be honest. And Sergio said to me that, um, you know, he runs an engineer company in Brazil. And he said, you know, Paul, an engineer is always like that. We do mistakes. But the engineer mistakes, we can fix it. So go back home, take your time, try to figure out what's the problem. Try to figure out how much it costs to fix the problem. And if it's feasible, and if you want to take the challenge to fix it, then we can talk again and, and decide what to do. So I went back home and, and I start to rerun all my analysis and you know go back on the fee model that I did and, and, and try to understand why the wing failed. And at that time I was puzzled. I was thinking that I was not capturing something about composites or something like that. And, and running the fee model, I, I saw this stress concentration on the junction between the wings. And my first thought was, well, I didn't have a, a, a refined model in that area and maybe this stress concentration was higher. So to look the stress concentration better, I, I isolate just the outboard wing. So I remove the inboard wing, just look the outboard and the stress concentration went away. And I was like, wait a minute, but the outboard wing is the one that bro broke. Why the stress concentration is only on the inboard wing? And then looking better, I saw that on the inboard wing, the way that I, the inboard wing is the one that has a fork, is the one uh, on, the, on the bottom left picture is the spar on the right. And that spar has a fork and, and a pin goes through that fork. And to transfer the load of that pin to the shear web, I put those, you can see on red on this picture here. I don't, I'm pretty sure you guys can see my mouse. Um, I put some blocks of solid fiber there. And because it's a fork, I do have four shear webs to transfer that load. But on the other side, the, the outboard wing, uh, that's a boom, I only have two shear webs. So my blocks had to be longer. And that's the reason that on the inboard wing, I do see some stress concentration on the transition of the blocks the, between the red and the kind of yellow here. But on the outboard wing, the block is the pink part here. I should see any stress concentration. And then I realized that I did a mistake. I designed the wing correctly, but when I look on my CAD model, you can see here on the bottom left, I cop and paste that same block between all the spars and I build the wing this way. And that's what caused the snap was that stress constant, that, that, that block was not long enough to transfer the load. Um, I actually, I rerun the fee model for the case that we actually test and the model predict the failure by 1%. So what the model was actually pretty, pretty good oh, no. for that. <laughs> Uh, luckily, the failure was on the outboard wing, which is pretty light, you know, so the amount of carbon that you need to rebuild that wing is really low. And I had leftovers uh, for the prepreg material, because the prepreg, you can't buy small quantities, you need to buy big quantities, uh, because it's especially made for us. So I had leftovers for that. And the, the inboard panel had some damage, but it was possible to fix. And then I give another call to a surgeon and I told him I figured out the problem, explain why the problem was there. And, and I told him the, how much 
more financial support we need for the rebuild. <laughs> and that was totally feasible, yeah. both for him and for me as time-wise. And we redid. And I guess eight months later, we redid the structural test, and here's the wing, um, 16 feet off the flexion at the tip. <laughs> at the position. So, Insane. yeah. In the airplane final. But yes, it's it's a setback, big setback, probably one of the biggest ones that I had on my career. Um, I remember Luke Forsman writing me an email saying, don't worry, uh, you know, glider manufacturers did that already. So you're not the first one. <laughs> and uh, all that support for the people working with me. And, and, and I normally, I, I like to say this, you know, surgeries is sponsoring all of that. But more than the the, the financial sponsoring, he's a is a motivational sponsor. All that he's always have fun doing the project, and and he he share with me the the happiness and and the the, the anxiety of the project, and 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 I'm really happy to work with him and have his support on this. So it was tough but good for another learning experience. Yeah. That's good to hear. So let's talk a bit about fly by wire. Um, we at Akafli Karlsruhe, we have this, you could call it a running joke um, about building the AKX. It's it's super complicated with all these mechanical controls and we, we keep on saying, oh man, we should have, we really should have built it in fly by wire. But unfortunately for us, it was a little bit, uh, a little bit too big of a challenge to build a uh, flying wing and fly by wire. But we can definitely understand the motivation behind building fly by wire. But what about you? What was your deciding factor for choosing this technology? Yeah, the 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 goal was, as I mentioned before, this optimization of the flap system. You know, try to be able to to avoid all the hassle to design mechanical mixing, and and more than that, changing that mixing in flight. Uh, if I want an airplane that flies faster, I can use this setup. If I want an airplane that flies better, I can use that setup. Uh, so that that is the goal that we we I'm looking for for that. But the question about the flyby wire is also um, the amount of opportunities that the flyby wire open for you. It's we we can talk about uh, flight optimization. We can talk about load alleviation, a uh, flutter suppression, um, make the airplane accessible for for people that can't use all the controls. Um, so. That that was what really drive the 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 decision for the flyby wire. Yeah, I understand. Um, so in regards to flyby wire, for me personally, the first thing that pops in my head is redundancy. Of course, should be key in any design. So, what fail safes did you include in the in the design of of Nixus? Yeah, you're right. So. When we talk about the flyby wire, um, it's really the first question is how we make it safe. And one of the first decisions that I made on Nixus was to still have one mechanical aileron connected to the stick. So if the whole flyby wire fails, we can we can still fly the airplane. Of course, with re reduced um, authority, but we still safe to fly, and, and I guess this is a good uh, compromise. You know, you the, the mechanical system that I have for the ailerons is fairly simple; uh, doesn't take much to have it, um, and and it's mixed with the flyby wire, so I can optimize that during the flight, um, but keeps it safe. The other thing that we did is to to have a triple redundancy. And <clears throat> the architecture that we're using, it's pretty much described on this picture. I don't want to go into the stream details, but pretty much we have uh, three computers running asynchronous all the time, driving information or, or receiving information for uh, some re redundant sensors, but we also have some common sensors. So when I say common sensors, is one sensor for all the three computers. 
Um, but they, those computers drive at a triple bus uh, inside the wing. The decision to use a, a triple bus instead of a single bus was to try to avoid uh, or to mitigate failures uh, on the connectors between the wings um, and the wing and fuselage. And then inside the, the wing, where we have all the servos, we had another computer, a small computer that we call a node. Uh, I actually, I have a picture of, yeah, this is the, the picture of the board um, that this node that actually received the triple information from the buses and decide which information to trust and then drives the servo. And, and with this configuration, uh, we can fairly easily identify failures on the servos, on the nodes, or on the communication. And then we can have actions to, to, to prevent the, the biggest problem of the flyball wire system on the aileron system that is asymmetry. Or we can transmit that information to the pilot so the pilot can oversee the system and, and make decisions about that. So deal with the fly-by-wire is it's a different problem. You know, when you're doing mechanical control system, we know how to do that, all the kinematics, stress analysis, force analysis. With fly-by-wire, change the address of the problem. And the problem is start to be software design, um, electronics architecture, and integration of those things into the airplane. So here are my pictures, I can show you a little bit. Um, we have each control surface has a dual servo. So this aluminum, aluminum case goes under the wing and it's flush with the wing. Initially, we designed this out of aluminum and with um, some NACA intakes and outlets for cooling the servos uh, because Servo temperature is really the parameter that you need to look for to assure the life of your servos. But after the first flights, we decided that we didn't have to have the, the NACA inlets for cooling. The servos are running all the time at really low temperature. Um, and we decided to change the case to a plastic uh, uh, material for, for better insulation, electric insulation. Um, and the trade-off of design a flyby wire system is the picture on the on the right side here for me. It's connectors. So connectors everywhere. And they are, you need to be really careful putting them together to make sure they are um, mechanically safe. Because if the connectors start to give you trouble, that's when it gets nasty, the flyby wire system. So yeah, that's the trade-off of the flyby wire design. Yeah, you can't win them all. <laughs> so um, how did you certify the plane? Do you think it would be certifiable according to CS22? And I mean, uh, especially in regards to stall speed and fly-by-wire? Yeah, no, Nix is, Nix is, you know, in US, also in Brazil. I know that in Germany, you guys don't have that, but we have the benefit of the experimental category. And, and Nix is, it's not to be certified CS22. <laughs> uh, the wing loading that we are flying probably it will not reach the stall speed requirements for the CS22. But um, we are trying to develop technology, you know. Uh, we are not... Um, um, technology uh, Laws are written by, by, by us. And they are written when we... based on the technology that's available. When you try to push the limits on the technology, uh, sometimes it's impossible to follow all the rules. And in, we, I'm not saying that we're going to break the rules, <laughs> but we need to find a place that we can build this and test it uh, with a special rule that allows us to do that. And that's the case of the experimental category. Um, so I don't think the CS22 is ready for certify a, a, a flyboy airplane yeah mm. but with the the knowledge that we are developing and and you guys will develop a flyboy wire sailplanes pretty sure i'm this is coming uh, actually i know that it's coming <laughs> um 
that with that technology developed, then we can go and adjust the laws to say what is necessary to make this safe or not. So Nixus is not to be certified right now on the CS22. And uh, that's, that's completely out of our radar right now. <laughs> well, since you just mentioned it, um, I'd like to clear on a side note, uh, say that Akaflieg Berlin and Akaflieg Stuttgart, they're also looking into fly-by-wire. Um, they have a little bit different concept, but both of them are looking into a plane that also uses a Wortmann style Fowler, Fowler flap to change the wing area. So yeah, there's definitely a lot of research uh, going on in that space. Um, but talking about fly-by-wire again, you know, some critics might say that fly-by-wire takes away from, from the technical skill of being of, of what it means to be a glider pilot. How, how would you respond to that? What is your opinion? Do you really see it as giving up control to a system or do you think it, it's more about opening up new opportunities for the pilot? So my point of view is, you know, every time that new technology is coming up, you're going to face some criticism, no, <laughs> no matter what. I'm pretty sure when they start to do, do the composite sailplanes back in the day, you know, people was making jokes. Of how, how come are you going to make a sailplane out of plastic? <laughs> no, wood is much better. And, and, or aluminum, you know. And so new technology always going to face some criticism. Um, and I don't think we're taking anything away from the pilot. Uh, we actually give him more work to do and, and, and more opportunities to work more, you know? Um, yeah, that, that's my point of view. The flyby wire is not here to take anything. It's not that the flap, because the flaps are automatic, it, it's not reducing pilot, um, um, opportunity to fly. It's just giving him more time to think about other stuff. Hmm. And, and that's that's what I think uh, the fly by wire really is. But yes, you're going to have a lot of criticism, um, but Always, yeah. you're here to learn. Yeah. <laughs> so um, earlier this week, Jim completed the first 1,000 kilometers uh, in Nixa. So congratulations on that milestone. Really great achievement. Um, how would you so um, now that you, now that Nixus has flown for a bit, can you go into any details on performance? How do you think it stacks up to the competition? So why we don't do this? To answer this question, I have a special guest here, and I'm gonna transfer the computer to my special guest, and he will tell you the story, and he will tell you if he likes or not to fly with a flyby wire <laughs> system. So welcome, Jim Payne. Hi Jim. <laughs> so yeah, Jim, what do you think? How does how does Nixus handle? How does it compare to to different planes that you've flown? Like say, for example, the Ash twenty five or, or more recent ones like the ASG thirty two. Well, the short answer is it uh, flies like ASH twenty five with uh, power steering. <laughs> but by having a fly by wire, the aileron forces are much lighter. We do have some aileron force, of course, because of the outboard panel having a connection to the stick. But uh, so it's uh, much less fatiguing on long flights. And the automatic flaps, of course, uh, they potentially give more optimization. And again, they're less fatiguing. You know, the earlier question um, about uh, where do you stop changing the technology? You, know, you have to go back and ban GPS if you're going <laughs> to um, really have pure glider pilots. So. Yeah, that's true. That's true. So, so from your um, personal point, I mean, you've you've flown probably the most uh, Nixus now. Um, what's your what's your bottom line? How are you? Yeah, what what's your opinion is, on it? Um, we haven't had any surprises. You know, the stall characteristics relatively well. They are straightforward. Um, you know, it uh, rolls nicely, and of course, uh, it performs a lot better than a twenty five on these uh, long glides we make when we're making these long <laughs> flights. Awesome. Sounds good. So um, maybe uh, um, back to Paolo. I was I was uh, I was still wondering about the performance characteristics uh, of Nixus. You want to give us any details on that, or is that still secret? <laughs> <laughs> it, it's still secret for us. <laughs> That's the problem. And um, 
We didn't spend too much time measuring it yet. We did some flies trying to measure it. Uh, what I can tell you is we still some have to do some work, especially on the low speed range. But on the high speed range, it's it's better than the expectations. Mm. Uh, better or equal than the expectations, I would say. Um, but uh, Jim has Jim has a, a, a input on that. <laughs> One thing we have in the airplane is a vector nav inertial system, and we've been experimenting with level decelerations to attempt to get a good glide polar. Um, Paulo created a display which shows a flight path vector, and uh, you, know, you dive into it uh, you know, 230 kph or so level off and just maintain a level attitude or actually level flight path. And uh, now it's a matter of figuring out a good uh, system of analyzing the data. But uh, I think that will give us some uh, excellent uh, polars. <laughs> Sounds great. Well, by the way, if you ever come or if you ever bring Nixus to Europe, uh, you're more than welcome to uh, come by the Ida Fleek summer meeting. It's where um, all the Aka fleeks gather and they measure planes. Um, we have a, a certain uh, we have a certain uh, type or way in which we measure it. We have a reference glider that whose performance is extremely well known, and we compare um, the planes that are measured to this reference glider. And we we do all of this in collaboration with the German Aerospace Center. So if you're ever in Europe, just uh, stop on by. Um, but yeah, that, that would be a pleasure. Uh, <laughs> the other idea is we can do the Ida Flick summer camp in California <laughs> or Nevada <laughs> and be all guys here. But that's going to be, that's gonna be a lot more fantastic. people having to come over. <laughs> yeah, just bring everybody to California or Nevada. <laughs> Sounds cool. Um, weather is probably a little nicer. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> so, um, how many hours have you have you gathered on Nixus? Um, and also, what are your plans for for the near future? What are your what do you want to experiment on? So, Nixus right now has twenty two flights, fifty eight hours. Uh, the thousand kilometers that Jim did uh, was with forty eight hours, which we think is a, a pretty good accomplishment for an airplane that has so much new technology to be reliable enough to go, you know, for a flight like that with such a small time. And the, the goal for the future is, I believe we, we need to um, log more hours on the airframe, you know, get to know the system more. Right now, uh, during the pandemic, I moved to Minden and I'm living on Jim's guest house, cooking for myself those days. So that's the worst part. <laughs> <laughs> um, and taking the opportunity of the good weather flight to 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 accumulate those hours, and Jim is doing more high performance flights. We still have a very short VNE uh, velocity right now. We're limited to 240 kil kilometers per hour. Uh, we want to do more flutter tests. Um, we we are try to refine the analysis and and get more confidence on the analysis that we have. We did GVT last year in San Diego with a company called ATA that also did the Perland GVT. So that information built up a lot of confidence on the, the structure and, and flutter models that we have. But we want to make sure everything is right and we want to do flight tests for that. And, and chase good weather for, for long flight and, and fast flights. And, you know, my, my goal is really have the airplane ready for Jim, Sergio, Morgan, the pilots that are flying the glider right now to, to, to get the best performance possible. <laughs> so you said you're uh, limited to V&E of 240 right now. What, um, what's the goal for it? What do you want to achieve in V&E? Uh, yeah, that's 240 indicated airspeed at sea level. That's, that's the number that we have. Um, um, let's say that the goal is a little bit higher than the normal 270 kph <laughs> let's the number for myself right now you know, <laughs> okay. I can't tell the number to the pilots and the pilots right here beside me otherwise he would try to go there <laughs> <Then> to... <laughs> <laughs> okay um, 
So yeah, um, at the end, Nixus seems like a, a very promising design. Uh, do you see uh, Nixus or a similar design ever being put into a production plane? Has any manufacturer approached you with interest? No, for Nixus with the, the wing loading that we have and aspect ratio and wing, no, that's that's fairly impossible. Just just to mention yesterday, we assembled the airplane in between some hangars at the airport here, and we are pretty confident that we could tow the airplane to the runway. Guess what? The the airplane could not fit between the hangars. <laughs> so, it's so big that we almost had to disassemble it to 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 take it to the runway. Uh, but we managed to maneuver and get it out. Uh, but it, it's it's. It's pretty close to impractical, you know. There's there's wingspan, so I, I don't. Nixus for this size would never be a, a production airplane. The flywheel art, the technology that we're developing, that's for sure. I think can go to production airplanes. Hmm. Um, not, maybe not exactly the one because this is just a prototype. Um, but the idea behind it, you know, and the fabrication techniques. I really think the pre-preg spark caps is the way to go. It's so much easier to fabricate. And there is a, a initial investment for the autoclave, but come on, I build the autoclave myself. It's not rocket science, you know? Uh, I'm pretty sure the manufacturers can do that and the investment pays off because it's so much easier to build those caps. Mm -hmm. And the, the quality is amazing good. You know, fiber alignment and, and, and the amount of voids is just, it's zero. And, and so that that's technology that I believe can go to the fabric to the production gliders for sure. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. So we're getting closer to wrapping this up. So I want to remind uh, you watching at home, you can ask your questions in the comments now, and um, Paola will be happy to answer them in just a minute. But first, I wanted to ask you. Um, you mentioned in the beginning you spent some time at Ackerflieg Braunschweig. Um, and now in California, we, you work together with students a lot, or even before in the other projects. And you also have connections to the newly founded Aka Fleek in California. Um, what would you say? How does the how does the Aka Fleek, um, or you know, the whole student university life, and especially in com uh, combination with gliding, how does it compare to what you've seen in Germany? Well, uh, I, what I have to say about this is that, you know, what you guys are doing as a students now doing the Ida Flick and being part of the Aka Flicks and what the German did with the Aka Flicks all this time is the way to go. <laughs> you know, that's the way to learn engineer is, is to have this type of experience, you know. And in Brazil, I was lucky enough to go to a university where my professor, Claudio Barros uh, had this same view and he tried to implement something similar in Brazil. So I learned engineer, aeronautic engineer, designing and building airplanes with, with him. And, and then I had the opportunity to carry on that model for mm, 16 years um, when I built all the three airplanes with students. And the students that participate on that process with me they just skyrocket, you know, they, they get much better than the other ones, especially to have the overview of the, the, the life cycle of airplane. You know, they can, they, they understand design, they understand the limitations of the design based on their uh, fabrication capabilities. They understand fabrication, they understand operation. They know how to behave inside an airport. They know how to talk with pilots and they know how to talk with engineers. So all of that, the only way to learn is if you're doing something like the stuff that the Aka Flake is doing. Um, I, when, I, when I got to Brauschwein, uh, Armin Quest gave me some books to read. And one of them was the autobiography of Kelly Johnson, you know, Lockheed um, um, Skunk Works chief engineer. And if you read his autobiography, uh, he writes there that the way to teach engineer, aeronautical engineer, is with the Aka flicks, like the Germans are doing. And, and that was really impressive with me. So when I moved here to California, um, 
I built a wing. Um, I was not a professor, uh, so the Nixus was my first airplane with th that I was building without students. And, and first, I thought that was you know a relief. I didn't have to advise students, you know, <laughs> just just build it. And and I learned that actually I like to build with the students, and I miss it a lot. And when the wing broke, that was on the structural test, as I show you, that was. A week after I moved my family to a new city in California because I, I took a new job. I decided to leave my job in Brazil and, and accept a new job at, at Cal Poly. And, and that initial devastation that I felt because of the, the failure, it turns out to as an opportunity because now I was joined this new university and I was bringing in a project that I could involve students again and give them the opportunity to, to do that. And for my surprise, Cal Poly had an ACA flick. Uh, it was created by two other professors before me, uh, Frank Owen and, and Kurt Coven. And, but the kids were there and they were sailplane pilots. They all liked sailplanes soaring and they understand the, the, what Nixus project was. So all the students, Bennett, Will, Zach, Newman, all of them jump in into the project immediately and, and help on that refabrication of the wing. So that was an example for me that, you know, sometimes you don't understand what happens in your life. And, and, and after a while, you start to put the dots together and understand. And that failure was kind of, a gift because it gave me the opportunity to give to that students um, the, the opportunity to learn something. And they were there with us and Jim on the first flight. Actually, two of them went to to, to Argentina on the last Perlan mission. Okay. So all of that is only possible if you have groups like Acaflix inside the universities, you know. Yeah. So that that's my opinion about Acaflix. That I was that's the reason that I was so excited to to give this talk to the Ida Flick, because somehow I feel that I'm trying to pay back my time in Brauschwein because that was so so important for my career. That time in Brauschwein. That's really nice to hear. I I too think it's um really valuable the the time that you spent in in Acaflix. So um, let's move on to the questions. We have quite a lot of questions lined up. We'll see if we can get through all of them. First up, we have Alex Albrecht. He says, or he asks, if you guys uh, optimize the, the lift distribution in turns. Yeah, that's one of the goals. So uh, not only in turns, but also when you apply maximum aileron deflection, uh, there are some articles published on uh, Steve and, and technical sorting about maximum aileron deflection or maximum row rate with minimum induced drag. So right now we have a really conservative uh, control law running on Nixus um, that does not do that, but that's for sure is on my radar for future uh, implementations. Nice. And then uh, JJ Morris asks if, um, or he says first off that he he really thinks that you're on the right path with what you're doing, but he would like to ask if you first considered um, just automatically driving the uh, the flap handle on a standard Ash thirty, you know, to get some initial tests. We we actually we did that. So Sergio has an Ash thirty in Brazil, and. And I flew him the first time with the manual flap. And I told him, give me two weeks and I will come back here. And I want to fly again with you. And in two weeks, I brought this linear actuator hmm. with a little Arduino, some sensors. We hook up on the handle and we flew. And, and that's how I hooked up on the project, <laughs> hooked him up on the project. It was so amazing. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so Nix was a step further on that. To, to, to do the full flower wire because just driving the handle does not allow you to do stuff like the, the turn optimization or the roll rate optimization. Yeah, so th that's the reason that we move forward on that. Mm -hmm. And then Felix Santosa, how are the uh, or how is the mechanical aileron mixed with fly-by-wire 
And also in addition, he asks if um, the flaps are they still controlled or coupled to the flap lever, um, or is it fully automated? So first, the, the mixing, it's, it's a bell crank system, it actually goes inside the wing. And um, if he goes on Facebook, Nix's Facebook page, on the very early stage on the project, I'm pretty sure I have a, a drawing and a video explain the system. But uh, basically what it is, is the SICK can move aileron and the servo moves that aileron as a flap. And, and the, the aileron bell crank is assembled with a spring, such a way that if the servo fails, that bell crank that mix the servo to the aileron goes to a stop, and then you have still have aileron. Of course, above a certain speed, that, that spring will be overcome by the hinge moment. But if, if you have a failure, you know, you're not trying to go fast anymore. Uh, the second question is, if you move the flap handle, you still be able to control the flyby wire, or sorry, the flaps. Um, we actually, what we do right now is to put the flaps on automatic, you need to go flap one, full forward flap, and switch, uh, switch on the dash, and then you go automatic. So if you're on the automatic mode and something goes wrong, you can immediately grab the handle and put the flap that you need and the automatic system will, um, will uh, how to say, decouple immediately. Oh, that sounds like a good design. <laughs> um, yeah. So uh, Florian Grunwald has uh, another question. He asks, what kind of HIRF protection um, have, you, have you used for, for the Nixa? So this is probably an electrical, electrical question. I'm studying mechanical engineering, so I don't quite understand it. But um, he asked if you maybe, maybe used overbraids for the harnesses. Okay, so yeah, it is. Is it is? I, I have the same problem as you, Dominique. I, <laughs> I, I am a mechanical guy, and then I decide to design all of this. So I had to learn a lot about. So he's probably asking about electromagnetic interference. Probably, yeah. and it's really simple because the only thing that I did is just uh, grounding braid on the, all the cables. All the cables are twisted pairs. Um, you kind of can see on this picture that's on the screen. All the blue cables. It's um, it's um, um, it's actually a certified cable for data transmission airplanes. Cost uh, pretty expensive, and, and and that's what we did. Um, actually, during our talk here, I would just move for some pictures for Nicholas Klein. But so that's how we did the AGMI. It's it's really simple. Um, all the data communication. I use a 485 bus. Um, a lot of people who ask why not a CAM bus is it, just because some parts of the shelf that I was using use the 485 and what's convenient for me. If I would do a next one, probably I would do a CAM bus. Um, and he asked one thing more about um, overbraids for the harnesses. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly what we did. It's okay. all, all the, the the cables are twisted pair with the uh, grounding protection mm -hmm. that's what we did okay it's actually important on this the electrical side of the the flap system to mention that each pair of servos so let's say flap number one right and left wing they receive power from a, a, a single secret break breaker and i will move a little bit forward on those pictures because this picture of the dash the front dash you can see on the on the left side, top left side of the, the instrument panel, there is a set of circuit breakers. And you can see here three, four, five, and six. And those are individual pairs of servos. So if you need, during the flight, you can pull those circuit breaks out and you're gonna switch off a pair of servos on each time. And, and that helps also to drive the, to reduce the e e EMI because my, my cable, my servos are not drain current from a single line of power. Mm -hmm. Each one of them has individual power lines. So one thing I don't think was mentioned is 
Each side has uh, six control surfaces. So the flapper on is divided into six segments. Yes. Hmm. That, that's also a really good safety um, alternative because if you start to lose some flaps, you're not losing big sections <laughs> at the uh, same time. You lose the small sections. Uh. Okay, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna combine two questions here. Um, so how do you how do you take the the stick input? Do you take it right at the stick itself, or later in the fuselage? And also, you, what sensors do you use? Is it custom ones or off the shelf ones? Um, because we're using the Ash Thirty fuselage, it was convenient for me to take it down uh, on the control system mechanisms behind the pilot. Um, but I think if I would do a full fly-by-wire system, I would do it straight on the stick. It's easier. Uh, for now, I'm using linear potentiometers from Jeffran. Um, it's an Italian company. And I've been using the same ones for the Red Bull Air Race, which is a really worse environment. And, and they are really, really good, both in terms of durability and linearity. And that's the reason that I'm using them. OK. Um, and Alex Albrecht has a couple more questions. He asks if um, Nixus follows a multiple law approach um, or um, if it's steered with direct law, if you've implemented flight protection. Um, and then he also asks about the optimized lift distribution in turns, which we already talked about. But he also wants to know if you um, if you can if you can forward the links to the articles and papers and you could actually send the, those to us and we would put them under the video if if you have uh yeah if you have those he, he would be interested in that <laughs> okay i i don't have a, a lot of uh, scientific articles published yet um i'm trying to collect more information to make sure the stuff that i did is okay to publish um before I publish something. Um, I would say Nixus now has two modes. Is the direct mode where you, you know, just grab the handle and that, that just drive all the, the, um, the flaps. And, and this automatic flap mode where the flaps are driven by the computer. And, and then another mode that we can say that we have is the, I don't know how to, we need to create a name for that, but it's the, the off mode where the fiber wire is completely off uh, you, and you still can fly the airplane. Of course, um, you only drive the outboard aileron, so that gives you about a third of the, the roll rate that you have. And we already did tests with that on different phase of the flight, and it's possible to fly the airplane. Um, and for landing, if you have to land on that configuration, uh, the flaps will be floating. Uh, we did calculate stall speed for that condition, and it's a little bit faster, but um, you know it, it's, it's the price that you pay for for such a big failure. So far on flights, we never had a, a, a complete failure of the system on those 58 hours. Uh, when I download data, I do see sometimes that the servos are not communicating with the flight computer, but Gene never. Um, uh, report that to me saying, oh, uh, I feel a symmetry or something like that, which means every time that we have that miscommunication, the computer system is actually doing the right thing to avoid a symmetry on the system. Okay. Um, the spam 1924, uh, he has two more questions. He asks how will you solve or how you go about the redundancy on dual servos? if you've implemented a clutch between them in case one is jammed. And he, he also wants to know if your elevator and rudder are still mechanical or if they're also fly-by-wire. Elevator and rudder are still mechanical, no fly-by-wire there. Um, the two servos, is, it's a, it was a tough decision to go that direction. Um, the reason that I decided to go two servers per surface is because I was really concerned with server temperature. And, and I had a hard time deciding which servers to use because the, the first tendency that I had was to go to the UAV um, uh, uh, market 
and start to look for UAV servos. But uh, you can, there you're going to find the RC model servos, which I don't want to use because they are not reliable. <laughs> and then on the other side of the spectrum, you have the high quality servos. And normally when you call those companies and ask for a price of a servo, they, they make the question back to you. They ask how much money you have. <laughs> and, and, and I didn't want to play that game. So I found that not a servo is used for robotics, and, and that's the one that I'm using. But because they're not really for airplanes, I was concerned with temperature. And they actually, they use Maxon Motors, uh, which is a Swiss company that produce motors that are really reliable. I had to use them before in other applications. So I was kind of okay with that, but questioning that. So how you put two servers together? The problem is if you put two servers together, they're going to fight each other. And that, that is really, really bad. This company that I use, the servers, they have a system to synchronize ser uh, servers working together based on current, not in position. So one servo has the position measurement, and that's the one that drives the, 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 the feedback loop to find the right position of the servo. But then that servo creates a signal that goes to the second servo that just followed the same current. Therefore, they are producing pretty much the same torque. Mm -hmm. And that's how the servos are synchronized. So right now, if one servo jam, yeah, the system will not work. You're going to receive a failure saying that the server is not moving. And then you pull the secret brake and, and take that system, that servo out of, the, of the, your control system. Um, as soon as one server stops to move, the flight computer feels that and, and send the other wing to the same last position that the server was. That's how we avoid a symmetry. Um, but, and, and that's how I synchronize the servers. Hmm. Nice. Um, we have another one from C. Dorel, I think it's pronounced, probably a username. Um, he wants to know some more details about the autoclave. Um, what temperature do you keep it at and how do you keep it evenly and equally distributed? Um, and what, what pressures are you using and how, he, how you've uh, manufactured your molds to be able to withstand the autoclave? Okay, that's a good question. Good memories, because <laughs> I really enjoy designing the autoclave. The autoclave <laughs> is actually a pre, I think it's a pretty neat solution that I come with. Um, it's just a steel tube, you know, oil pipe. I put two flames at the end and make a vessel. And, and then I pressurize the autoclave with an external source. And on the bottom of the autoclave, I have an air compressor machine that... It's not really there to compress the air, but it's there to recirculate the air on the outer clave. So this normal air compressor machine is able to do 20 cubic feet per minute as an air compressor. But because now the intake of that air compressor is connected to the vessel and the outlet of the air compressor is connected also to the vessel, both sides see the same pressure. And not only this, so that, that machine is not producing much work, but not only that, they see higher pressure than at atmospheric pressure. So they can pump way more volume than they can do when connected to the atmospheric pressure. So that way I can recirculate the air on the outer clave super fast um, with minimum of a power. And then as I recirculate the air, the air goes through um, um, uh, electric heaters that you know warm up the air the, the, the air inside and 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 control the temperature. Um, on a 40 feet long autoclave, uh, we had temperature difference between one end to the other end on the order of one degree Fahrenheit, which is pretty good for autoclaves. Um, so that's how we build the autoclave. Um, you can for lower temperatures you can pressurize with just compressed air. For higher pressures, you probably want to use nitrogen just because the, the partial pressure of oxygen increases a lot and there is risk of explosion. Um, we run everything, all the composite that we use from PATS materials here in California was a 250 degree uh, uh, material uh, at 60 PSI. All the molds were made out of, um, it's a special tooling foam 
um, mainly out of silica. It's a little bit uh, nasty to machine, but um, once you machine and seal them, they are just fine to work. And the good thing about that is zero CTE, uh, thermal expansion coefficient is zero. Uh, so pretty close to carbon. And, and also it's an insulation material. So that helps on the, to control the exothermal of the resin during the curing process. Cool. Um, Robert, Robert Berrios, uh, he says, you mentioned that the spar caps are made out of pre-prec, um, but how did you deal with laying the fork uh, at the wing junction? You know, how, how did you split the fibers? Uh, so you need to make sure that the forks has that angle that the interlaminar uh, um, stress that you have or interfiber stress that you have will be enough to transfer the, the actual load. So, because he is right, you can't bend the fibers on that direction. So all of your fibers are aligned. So you really need to have a smooth angle. So the interfibers strength it's enough to transfer that load for you. Hmm. Okay. Good question. <laughs> um, someone named Numerical Instability uh, asks what software you use for your vertex lattice analysis and if it's coupled with structural deflections. Yeah, that's a, uh, it's my own software. Uh, hmm. We call it C uh, VLM. Uh, I wrote this back with uh, students in Brazil. Hmm. And it is coupled with Nastran. So I can run the, 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 the aerodynamic analysis and it's a non-linear aerodynamic analysis um, with the structural model at the same time. Okay. And uh, I hope I'm pronouncing this right. Uh, Raupe Marco Sousa asks uh, if you used MDO to, to determine some wing parameters like AR and geometry. Um, not really. Natural MDO, you know, <laughs> try and error. <laughs> yeah, it makes sense. <laughs> um, yeah. See, Dolan asks, what's your, with Nexus, what's your approach speed before landing? Jim. <laughs> the approach speed for landing, I've been uh, flying uh, 120 kph. Okay, so, so quite speedy. <laughs> It could be slower. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, and then another one from JJ Morris again. If you've considered using Hall effect sensors for uh, for the servos. Uh, the servos are actually, they do have Hall effect sensors. Okay. So the feedback is based on Hall effect sensors, which is a good advantage because, you know, there is no wear on those. Hmm. There's no potentiometers to wear there. Okay. And then the last question we have is from Adriano Almeida. And um, he wants to know what the main differences you observed in handling quality due to this huge wing. And I mean, Jim, you've already talked a little bit about handling, but maybe you can go into some more detail on that. Okay. Um... Well, you know, flying open class sail planes, I've got a pretty smooth technique. And uh, it is that there's been no surprises. Um, the adverse yaw is not extreme. And, uh, you know, it's very easy to control speed. Um, you know, the flight we made uh, the other day is one of the first long thermally flights we've made. And uh, it's circling pretty well, you know, down around. Showing 90 kph on the dial. Okay, that's the that's the feedback from probably the best open class <laughs> sailplane pilot in the world. Uh, I flew it as well, and of course, 28 meters. And and I'm an airplane pilot, you know, 28 meters. You need to learn how to do with that. Yeah. <laughs> and, and some things start to get a po opposite. You know, you don't. You don't apply aileron and then do a little bit of rudder. You apply rudder and then do a little <laughs> bit of aileron. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so for him, I don't know what his experience flying. 28 meters is not something that you sit down inside and go fly. Mm. And it, it's not. 
yeah different world <laughs> Yeah. Okay, well, thank you so much, Paolo and Jim, um, for taking mm -hmm. the time to talk about the Nixus project. Um, I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, it thank you to the viewers at home for tuning in. I'm sad to say okay. that this is uh, our last talk, talk for now, because luckily there's an upside to this. We in Germany can slowly start flying again. So um, we won't be doing these talks now, but we're definitely looking into starting them again when fall rolls around and the gliding season has finished. So, okay. yes, thank you very thank much. You. Take care. <laughs> take care. And to everyone at home, take care, stay healthy, and bye bye. Bye bye. Right. Good job, Paul. Yeah, good. Thank I you, Jim. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>